Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. I already complained about this before, but it is just so NHL to change their app and website to just objectively worse versions of themselves right before the season. I remember prior to last episode, we were trying to figure out some things with the Red Wings schedule, went to the app, and immediately the confusion that washed over our faces was uh, noticeable. Is this the NHL being the NHL, or you and I just slowly morphing into, you know, old old man does not know how to use phone anymore, angry at kids. Why not both? <laughs> <laughs> Red Wings hockey is back. We watched a Detroit Red Wings game last night. How insane was that? Uh, it felt like preseason, but in a good way. I, you know what I, I always say. I don't complain about hockey anymore. Like, you know, when hockey is on or, oh, this game was at a bad time, et cetera, et cetera. Because when COVID came and it swept hockey away from us, I'm like, we, we were blessed. We were privileged. I am not going to whine about being able to watch hockey anymore. There's just so much more fulfilling once it's on. That's how you know this is, you know, we bleed hockey. It does not matter how much it tires you out. It doesn't matter how much, you know, the coverage, the grind of a season from a, a media perspective or any of that just kind of wears you down to a bone. When hockey is on, it's just so much better. I like that football starts first because it kind of primes you a bit. And then you're like, mm, no, but the real stuff's coming. Yeah, and the nice thing about the NFL starting first is nothing overlaps with 99% of the hockey schedule. Yeah. So you can have the best of both worlds. That's right. All right, folks, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast, here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, and a special bonus interview today. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And Evan is still away on his trip to Italy to get married. Actually, they they have been married, him and Catherine. He will be back. Well, we'll see if he ever gets on a flight back. If I was him, I, I've been seeing the pictures and videos, I wouldn't come back, but he will be back eventually. See, out of the three of us, though, he's the only one that might actually be able to afford to not come back. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, looking at those pictures, I'm like, wow, that seems nice. His new life seems phenomenal. A smart upgrade from the studio, I would say. <laughs> On this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast, we're going to be covering Detroit's first preseason game and the storylines that came out of it after their 4-3 win over the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yes, it's just preseason, but there actually was quite a bit that was illuminated, I think, from that game that was uh, really interesting to see. Nate Danielson open scoring for the Red Wings, so awesome storylines there. We'll be doing our first division preview ahead of the 2023-2024 NHL regular season. We're going to start with the Central just to get the Chicago Got Bedard storyline out of the way so we don't have to face that reality anymore. And then we have an interview with Lauren Gable, professional women's hockey player, recent draft pick of Boston in the PWHL. You'll hear us joke about it in the interview, but the first time we've ever had a pro hockey player in this studio. She came, uh, she's local, so she uh, was in the room with us, which was awesome. And then we'll get into whatever other NHL news there is before overtime. Before we get into that, though, first, Winged Wheel podcast night at the LCA, Saturday, November 4th. It's the Red Wings game against the Boston Bruins. What Winged Wheel podcast night is, is a partnered event between us and the Detroit Red Wings in benefit of the Jamie Daniels Foundation, where we host a live episode, a live recording of the Winged Wheel podcast at Little Caesars Arena before the Red Wings game. So you come, you hear us, you watch us record an episode. We take questions and comments from the live audience. It features special guest Ken Daniels, and we have another special guest coming up, but we won't spoil who it is. We like to mix it up for you guys. In addition to that, there's going to be giveaways, prizes, merch, things like that. Food and drink will be available for you. After that, we all go in to watch the game together in special Winged Wheel podcast seating sections, and your ticket is discounted. So not only do you get access to the event and the game, your game ticket is actually discounted. Uh, in addition to that, the ticket comes with a co-branded Detroit Red Wings and Winged Wheel podcast beanie, so it's officially licensed Detroit Red Wings merchandise. has the Red Wings logo and our own logo on it, and that comes as part of your ticket as well. You can sit in the lower bowl, upper bowl, or the gondola, which is the same view that Ken and Mick have as they call the game. So wingedwheelpodcast.com slash Red Wings or go to the link in the description of this episode to get your ticket. You get the discounted ticket, you get the beanie, you get access to the live show, you get access to obviously to the Red Wings game and a portion of the proceeds from every ticket sold will benefit the Jamie Daniels Foundation. So it's an excellent, excellent cause. 
the only catch is the first 400 tickets are the only ones to get the beanies. So those are over halfway sold already. If you'd like to get your special edition Winged Wheel Podcast Detroit Red Wings beanie, make sure to get your tickets today. Wingedwheelpodcast.com slash Red Wings or go to the link in the description. Get your tickets today. Also, a quick note, this podcast is entirely made possible by our Patreon supporters. Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast. If you want to support the show, you get access to our Patreon exclusive bonus overtime episodes. Any other bonus episodes that we record, you get access to our Winged Wheel Podcast Patreon exclusive Discord. Uh, additionally, you're automatically entered into all of our giveaways. We are giving away two tickets to every Detroit Red Wings home game this year. The vast majority of them will go to our Patreon supporters. So again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. Pretty cool that Nate Danielson kicked things off for the Red Wings. I think, you know, storylines about all the other players that could have been drafted at ninth overall aside, storylines about, you know, Danielson's timeline and, and what's his offensive ceiling. Forget all of that. It's just a nice little touch for the preseason where nothing really matters to have something like a little cherry on top, on top of a, an opening night win for Detroit. No, I personally think we should make large sweeping conclusions based on this one game of hockey in this one moment. Uh, and we will in base our entire podcast around that for the next two to four years. Yeah. Remember folks, preseason doesn't mean anything unless it's it is good. conducive to the narratives that you're trying to push or it's for your favorite team, in which case it means everything. Yeah, exactly. Nate Danielson scored a goal. Uh, so this episode is going to be a 30-minute diatribe on how he has saved the franchise. <laughs> I've been seeing the proclamations of Zach Benson being, you know, the next big thing. And you know me, I'm a big Zach Benson fan. Evan, who's not even here, is a huge Zach Benson fan. And my reaction has been, hey, look, I really like Zach Benson. I think Sabres fans should pump the brakes a little bit. He's 18 and it's going to take some time for this kid to stick. I think he will. And then with Nate Danielson, you see all the replies to it. It's like, Who's to say the Red Wings are ever going to lose a game again, you know? Yeah, honestly. Zach Benson makes the opening night roster unexpectedly for Buffalo. Cool. But does he play center? <laughs> he does not checkmate Buffalo. Uh, no, it was it was really a good game from Danielson, though, uh, from, from a serious standpoint. You know, a couple rookie mistakes mixed in there. Uh, I think the turnover that led to the penalty. Um, but for the most part, all of his strengths were really apparent. He was patient with the puck. You could see the way he processes the ice, his vision, his creativity, his tenacity too. He forced a couple turnovers. I think he forced, I think it was actually him that forced the turnover right before his goal. Um, and it was phenomenal play all around. And then obviously he's a good shooter. So, you know, it doesn't seem impossible to beat Nedeljkovic on a shot from there these days. But <laughs> Hey, Ned played really no, well he for the did. first he was, little while. He was great, but there was no way I wasn't making that joke. No. Um, and we love Ned, so, you know, I feel bad doing it, but I'm still doing it. But, no, it was – Danielson showed off what made him the ninth overall pick in that game, and it's preseason, and it was largely against Pittsburgh's AHL team. But it, you want him to show you the reasons we're excited, even though it's only preseason, and he did a great job of that. Yeah, his play off the puck was very impressive. Once you see a player like that in preseason, like the exhibition games, not that they mean nothing, but you're almost you almost don't care about the result. It's like, oh yeah, the Red Wings now took the lead again. I forgot that they had even lost it. You're just watching individual players a lot of the time, so you zero in on Danielson when he's on the ice, and you're like, wow, that was a really nice play off the puck. You're right, he did force that turnover, Bradley, and he moved with speed, and the way he was thinking the game was apparent. And that's hard for young players to do. Like he's going back to the WHL. It's that, and that's not a, a knock on him. That's just where he's at in his development path with his age and everything. It's really hard to come into the NHL and shine, even if you are going against guys who are largely not going to be in the NHL or their AHL team for the most part. So, yeah, he he came in and he made any kind of positive impression, which is it's tough. You have really good young players who will one day make their NHL teams who don't come in and do that in preseason. So it's a nice a nice sign to see from Danielson and the the surprising little touches as you noted like. His offensive ability was there. There were plays that he made that didn't turn into goals, but you know, if his teammates had been in the right place, could have been a, a massive scoring chance too. So are we going to draw massive sweeping conclusions or raise banners or, or yes, we are. draw victory routes or anything? Absolutely. The crazy ones of us will, yes. But no, in, in all honesty, you don't make too much of it, but as much as you can take signs and signals and nice-to-haves from a preseason game, that was uh, a good one from Nate Danielson. As you said, not a perfect game, but... Don't expect perfect games. It's preseason. 
it is worth noting that for players like Danielson coming out of junior into the NHL preseason, even though they're playing largely AHL teams, the worst AHL team would absolutely smack the best junior team. So it is still a significant step up in competition for these guys. Yeah, I always think back to that narrative that was prevalent in football a while back. Where it was <laughs> Could like, Alabama what? beat the Jaguars? Yeah, it was always Alabama, the poor Jags. <laughs> and it's like, no, those are grown men and they would destroy those kids. I, I understand it's different from football. You know, once you graduate from college football to the NFL, you're ready right away. It's not the same in hockey, but still, yeah, it, the worst AHL team would absolutely destroy any junior team. Now, let's talk about that for a little, a little bit here because Nate Danielson is, in all likelihood, barring something not impossible happening, but it would be a major, major storyline if he made it. He's going back to the WHL. He's He's going back to play for his junior team. And again, it's not his fault. Here are the things that are stacked against him. The CHL-NHL agreement is positioned in such a way where he can't go to the American Hockey League right now, which he could potentially make that team, and that'd be professional hockey, and it'd be a good step for him, but he's not allowed to. He has a lot of NHL-ready players ahead of him at either center or even at the wing on who are likely to make the Red Wings roster or potentially even miss it, and they have more experience and are more NHL-ready than him. There are prospects competing for the same spots as him who will have had more time to develop than him. So not only would he have to be better than all of his peers, the prospects trying to make the team, and all of the fringe guys trying to make the team, he'd have to be better than two or three actual NHL-ready players right now to make the roster. And you, you package all that up and you say, okay, wow, that's a really small chance, Ryan. You're right, but there's still a chance. Also remember, you know, Derek Lalonde was on this podcast a few episodes ago Steve Eisman has said in media a lot of times, there's no rush. There's no point in doing it. If Danielson doesn't give you a choice, then he doesn't give you a choice, and that's a wonderful problem to have. But in all honesty, there's no rush to move him to the NHL any sooner. So even if he has a phenomenal preseason, even if he shows up well in every single game, or, or pretty good, so to speak, where you're like, yeah, he could hang in the NHL right now. It would take a lot, I think, to convince Derek Lalone and Steve Eisman that he should stay rather than go back and just get another year of safer development in him. Yeah, and it's probably worth noting on top of that as well that this will not be the Michael Rasmussen situation because Danielson is a late birthday for the draft, just turned 19 today, I believe. Yeah, happy birthday, Nate Danielson. Yeah. He has already played three years in the WHL. So I believe so this upcoming season will be his last required year and he will be eligible for Grand Rapids the year after. Yeah. Unlike Rasmussen who had the two year because he was drafted as a a true uh, 18 year old. And, you know, the the hope is uh, Grand Rapids is never a stop for him. Like he can have a huge year in Brandon and then maybe get traded at the deadline to a contender and then come in, and walk on and make the wings out of camp. Unlikely still, because again, for all the reasons you laid out, there's like 37 NHL-ready forwards, plus about two or three other prospects in the same boat as him competing for those spots. But, you know, say what you will, he's been the most impressive of of them already through the prospects tournament, preseason, training camp. Uh, You know, we talked about on our, I think it was a Patreon, it might have been a Patreon exclusive where we kind of did our prospect rankings. And I think... We all, or at least one of us, uh, put Danielson at number one, not necessarily because he's the most NHL ready or necessarily the best, but because he's a center, because he has the highest ceiling, he's arguably the most important prospect in the system. Everything that has transpired over the last three weeks just further puts an exclamation point on that. T- on that, He is the most important prospect in the Red Wings system right now. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree. And, you know, further, you talked about NHL readiness. I think just to to summarize what we've just said it's still too early to kind of declare this as yeah this is one of his defining traits and he absolutely is playing like a guy who will be nhl ready but from what we've seen so far you're right he is playing like a guy who is showing up as expected he has the style of game he plays what we've seen from him in development his the fact that he's a late birthday he does seem to be an nhl ready guy or more nhl ready than his peers so i'm i'm actually pretty optimistic about next season 
Yeah, I, I you hope that a year out from his draft, especially as a late birthday, he's really pushing for that spot. So it shouldn't surprise anyone. Yeah. If he comes into Detroit's camp next year and is like, I'm not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that's the expectation, but it shouldn't be a surprise. Ideally, next year we're having heated conversations about, you know, should he be up right now because he deserves it or whatever, you know, fourth line player has a spot and he's instead getting minutes in the AHL. We want him to be a good problem to have kind of guy. It could be an interesting dynamic if Marco Casper doesn't make Detroit this year. And then both them are knocking on the door next year at the same time because it would be really hard to implement two young centers yes. into an NHL roster competing for a playoff spot at the same time. And I know over the course of the summer we talked about staggering prospect arrivals in the NHL because of this exact reason where you don't want two, three, four rookies at key positions coming in at the same time. But Detroit's also at a point in the rebuild. They can't be overly patient with all of these guys. Some of them need to get in the lineup ASAP if you want the Red Wings to comp- be competing in, we'll call it the Dylan Larkin window. Yeah, and that's when you start to you know let guys earn it and cycle guys out to the wing to shelter their offensive deployments and things like that. You figure out what veterans are best to play them with, and you know maybe they take turns at center. Maybe neither of them play center. Maybe Joe Valeno plays between them. It, it, there's a lot of ways you can do it. I would love if that was the case. So if it was, you know, Casper and Danielson pushing at the same time like that that shifts the narrative a lot for Detroit where there's a lot of potential energy right now like the springs are are being compressed but nothing has released yet so once we get that graduation of prospects and if it happens all at once that'd be pretty exciting for fans so that's Nate Danielson good for him to uh, to show up and factor into the first preseason game even though it's just a preseason game speaking of new arrivals though great Great showing from Alex DeBrinkett and uh, Shane Goss Bear. I think it was immediately apparent what those two are going to factor or how those two are going to factor into the Red Wings offense, the power play as well. You know, we saw the DeBrinkett, Larkin, Raymond line. Let's start with Shane Goss Bear, though. He changes the blue line for the Red Wings. Like, he is so dynamic on the blue line. And I know the bar is low because we're speaking relative to what the Red Wings have had in the past where it's like, Sider, Wallman, and Sider and Wallman. Gostas Bear was a big threat on the blue line, and he he the way he changed the power play and the way the offensive structure set up, like it was noticeable. Even the small things he does, I, I think it was on the Sider goal where he just held the puck towards the net, looking at the net for an extra second. That's all it was. It was not a significant play, but... What it did is it drawed the defender over to him because now he's a shot threat. He's looking at the net. He's pointing at the net. We have to respect this as an option. And then Mo Sider has 20 feet of free space when that puck gets to him because Goss Spare was able to draw the defender, the penalty killer over. Little things like that are just the things you can't teach yeah. on on offense. The guys either understand it or they don't. They have the instincts or they don't. He has it. He always has. This isn't a surprise. It's a surprise to us to see it on a power play because we've never <laughs> seen it. But it, it's a huge, huge plus. You know, obviously we know his defensive shortcomings, and I think we said at the moment we signed him, we don't care. That's not why he's here. We know where the Red Wings are deficient. If you can get him up to an adequate defender at 5-on-5, five five, what he's going to bring in the offensive zone is going to be a huge plus to this team, and it was obvious yesterday. Yeah, I, I'm curious to watch more complete games of him to see where I think the best deployment might be in that defensive group. But it did inspire a lot of confidence that the Red Wings now have more lanes open and how they want to configure their defense. Like, let's say you separate Wallman and Sider. Well, that is no longer as horrifying as it might sound. And it is still a little scary because those two had such wonderful chemistry and you're like, that brought out the best in Sider and it it really showed us how good Wallman really is. I know Prashanth Iyer, host of Expected by Whom and good friend of the show, uh, is a big proponent of get Jake Wallman some Norris votes. But honestly, Wallman is very underappreciated as a defenseman. You want your two best defensemen on the top pair, but Shane Goss's bear factoring in changes the way you think about the power play. It changes the way you think about pairings. It's no longer trying to, uh, it's no longer damage limitation for, you know, X player, put him with someone safe because he's a liability defensively. Like, he can actually factor in. So yeah, Goss's bear was dynamic on the blue line and that, it shouldn't have been a surprise, you're right, 
but it was still fun to watch. And Alex Dabrinkit. I mean, both of those guys factored in on on two goals, the Larkin goal and the Cider goal, both of them power play goals. But Dabrinkit, you know, it, it's one game, but the offensive touch is there. It, you, it's just simply offensive talent was injected into the lineup. We didn't see him, you know, with any six snipes or any of his hallmark kind of uh, goals that he was brought in for, but he still factored into the offense. And you can see the way he drew attention away from Larkin or Raymond, and, and you move the defense across the ice that way just by having that talent and that presence there. What did I say about Goss Despair? You have it or you don't. Yep. And not a lot of players in the Red Wings over the past few years had that natural offensive instinct. Dabrinkit's is very, very obvious. The underrated part about a good shooter is you have to be a good playmaker. Otherwise, you never get time and space because you can just shadow them, essentially, and, and they're useless. Well, when you can distribute the puck, uh, much like Dabrinkit did on Larkin's goal, it forces the defense to keep honest, to yeah. keep positions, to not overcommit to a pure shooter because that's not the only option. And if you blow coverage, you blow an assignment, you blow a lane, he'll find it, he'll get it there, and you're dead. Goss, Spare, Cider, Larkin, Raymond, Dabrinkit, Perron. Like, there's more and more this team is being built out with actual offensive weapons that can make a difference on the power play. And I know some folks think five on five is what the team should be focusing on or what any team should be focusing on. And you're right. But for a team that is starving for goals, they need to be converting on the power play. That's the, it's not the lowest hanging fruit, but it kind of is the lowest hanging fruit if you want to add there. So the fact that they now actually have, and we said this last season too, but it's, it's even more true now, I think, but the, the fact that they have even more tangible offensive threats is, yeah, it's a big difference. Speaking of presence, a positive presence, cool to see Michael Rasmussen back on the ice. He, he, it does change the feel of the team. Like he, the glow up, Michael Rasmussen's glow up is one of the best stories on the Red Wings, but it's like, it's a material difference for him to be back in the lineup, you know, in every scrum after the whistle. He he got a goal. He, he shot the uh, deflected shot off a pass from Edvinson, actually, who scored. And I think his was the game winner. Yeah. So good to see him back after the uh, late injury last year. Yeah, it, the season, feel, last season felt like it ended nine years ago. You almost forgot he was injured. I so when I saw the tweet, I think it was last week, that, oh, he's been uh, activated. I'm like, oh, yeah. That's right. That's awesome. Forgot about that. Let's go. And then it was cool to watch him score a goal uh, and sub subsequently have zero expression on his face. It felt like just last year yeah. all over again. Speaking of no uh, expression, everyone was privy to the classic WHL archetype of Nate Danielson. <laughs> this is every Western Hockey League player. They're all like cut from the cloth of Steve Eisenman, like Joe, the Joe Sack. Like they, they score and it's so serious. Like Jonathan Taves, just like captain serious all the time. Someone tweeted at me. They're like, I'm convinced this guy's not going to smile until the Red Wings win the cup. And like, you, you might be right. Are we convinced we're even going to get a smile then? <laughs> like he is the prototypical, you know, coastal hockey player out of Canada. Like that is just <laughs> how they were born and raised. It is so hilarious. Everyone's like, is he even happy? And it's like, yeah, but you know, he knows his preseason. It's just all, it's all business. It's like, hey, coaches love that attitude. Let me say. We should draft more kids out of the dub just to test this theory. Sure. Let's get, Fine. We Let's get weird. Fine by me. Actually, I, Ironically, you know which WHL player breaks this stereotype, Connor but then B but then breaks the stereotype in another way? Connor Bedard. Sebastian Cosa. Oh, yeah, that's right. The big, boisterous, energetic, you know, happy personality, which is the exact opposite of most goalies. So he, he's yeah. breaking the WHL trend and he's breaking the goalie trend. Yeah, something in the water, man. <laughs> You know who I was impressed by, or it was uh, really interesting to watch, was Willinder. Quietly, yeah. Yeah, like not a massive showy game. I think we've talked about the Red Wings who had like really strong games for the most part. But Willinder's interesting to watch. His skating is notable. Like I, We've talked about it quite a bit on the show and, and as we've covered the prospect as, since he's been drafted. But he does move pretty well for, for a guy his size, yeah? Well, between Cider, Edvinson, and Willinder, that's the plan. That's the archetype. You have a blue line full of big defensemen who can move. Yeah. So if he uh, lives up to the bill, that's 
you know, the quote unquote Iser plan come into fruition. Watching Edvinson, I think it was notable what he was trying to do with his game, a uh, much more kind of rough and tumble game where he's using his size, imposing a presence with his his physicality, how big he is, and that is in line with everything that Eisenman and Lalone have wanted. And it doesn't it didn't take away from his, you know, skill set that he was drafted for. He factored into the Rasmussen goal. He had a, a good game. I don't think the best game, but again it's preseason. But you can tell the kind of game that he's going to try to be playing to eventually make this team. We've said on previous podcasts that he has a tall mountain to climb to make the team. I, I don't think the odds are in his favor. It's fair to him or not, he would have to come out and have an outstanding preseason and make the team make a tough decision. But it's good that he's kind of building on that now. And you're you're seeing a little bit of what the Red Wings want him to develop. And he has a whole offseason of development to catch up on now. Yeah, it's not impossible for him to make the team. Uh, the average age of the Red Wings blue line is something in the mid 30s. So injuries are going to happen at some point this year, whether we want them to or not. Unlikely to happen this early in the season. And there still is seven viable NHL defensemen ahead of him. So in reality, it probably takes multiple injuries. But I, I think it's safe to say we'll see him at some point this year. And yeah. I frankly don't care if that's. November or February because again it doesn't matter this year mm -hmm. it's a development year for him no matter where it is but I think it's important he gets the reps and I think it's important he looks good in them so again not to make or definitely to make sweeping conclusions in the preseason <laughs> I think he's he's on the right track I thought Cop looked good too last night as well Jonathan Bergren his uh not the best game for him you know, not sounding any alarm bells, but I thought it was, I was chuckling to myself as the game was over because I was just making some notes for the show. And I came to my notes on Beargren and I thought back to what I said last episode, which was, you know, by all rights, he should be on this team because they need offensive ability. And the only way that this is even a conversation is if he doesn't earn himself a roster spot in the preseason, which would make the, my entire point previous moot. And he has the talent and ability to, to earn that roster spot. You're not declaring anything after one game, no. And he had a it wasn't it wasn't an awful game. I think it's made a little worse by the glaring turnover that led to the goal. But for Pittsburgh, but he is going to have to play better than he did last night to make this team. I'll say that confidently. Yeah, it wasn't as strong as showing, but this is kind of Bergeron's game. Even when he's playing well, he's not flashy, showy, a guy you're going to notice all the time. He doesn't play fast. He doesn't play physical. He's never done either of those two things, but he's that guy who finds the quiet areas and finds the lanes at the right time, and he's a very cerebral player. Some games it pops because, you know, he gets a goal and an assist or he creates about four scoring chances, whatever it might be. But the downside of the way he plays is, yeah, you get games like last night where when he doesn't create anything, hey, you don't notice him. He's just a, a guy out there. Now, you have to see the rest of the players vying for the spots play, and it wasn't the full cohort of Red Wings who are still, you know, on this preseason roster who played. So next game is Thursday uh, at Washington, 7 p.m., and then they have a Saturday game where they host Washington in Detroit, uh, at, also at 7 p.m. They play a day later on Sunday where they host Chicago, and then Tuesday, October 3rd, those are their next four games. So you're going to see these teams go back and forth. I would love to tell you what the games are after that, but the new NHL.com website shows you weak segments for some godforsaken reason. What a mess that website the is. The worst website. Apparently the Red Wings got a new app too, so hopefully that's a little better. Yeah. So anyhow, that's the next four games. The The roster spots are going to play themselves out. Cool to watch Red Wings hockey again. Cool to see Ken and Mick back our, on our screens. That's always a good sign. means fall is here, and, and we're ready for another full season of Wings hockey, hopefully 82 games and more. I'm allowed to be this ambitious early. But no, it was, uh, it was a good start to the season for the Red Wings, and we'll see how they fare against Washington on Thursday. All right, let's jump into more season prep. We are going to do our division-by-division division look at the NHL, and we are going to start with the Central Division. Are we starting here because we want to just get it over with with Connor Bedard? Yeah, potentially. But, you know, the West overall, I think, is an interesting conference. I don't think they have a lot of the same quote-unquote problems right now. I think the balance of a lot of like the Thunderdome-ness lays in the East, which leaves the West wide open in my mind. So, 
let's start with the Central Division. Uh, let's honestly, let's just do the Connor Bedard team, the Chicago Blackhawks. What is in store for them this season? Bad, but fun. Yeah. But real bad, but also fun. So uh, the very early stages of a rebuild. Uh, I think before we start recording, you described them as the 0506 Penguins, and that's yeah, very accurate. Crosby's rookie year where he did a lot of cool shit and everyone else sucked. They are going to lose a lot of games and yeah. not one person in Chicago is going to care. Like maybe Bedard and Hall and I, I don't know if Perry's going to play with them will do some cool stuff. But that team, you know, they they haven't really had Taves for a while, but they lost Taves. This just they sold the farm to suck a lot to get Bedard. It worked. Congratulations, Kyle Davidson, Kyle from Chicago. Much to our chagrin, the, the Blackhawks won the draft lottery, but now is the the price that they're going to pay. And that's okay. The job on him is to now retool, but by all rights, for this immediate season, this is a team that's going to be eighth in the division in my mind. it would have They would have to come together, or Connor Bedard would have to be way, way better than we would anticipate for them to be kind of anything else in my mind. I don't even think that would help. Sidney Crosby put up over 100 points his rookie year, and they were still terrible. So I, I, Bedard could have a huge Crosby-like year. I, I'm skeptical of that, but even if he does, they're still going to be terrible. The Winnipeg Jets. This is a team in turmoil, right? This is a team with no vision, no plan. Like, what are they doing? Kevin Dayoff's like, whole shtick for his entirety of his tenure there has always been he's the guy who doesn't make trades. He's the one who's uber patient. And then he goes out and makes this, you know, blockbuster uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois trade, did really well in that trade. So he can make good trades. He's already done one this summer. And he had two huge assets sitting there in Connor Hellebuck and Mark Shifley, both of whom seemed pretty unsatisfied with this situation in Winnipeg. And that's on top of the captain leaving for New York, or if not, wasn't the captain last year. And then nothing. He's going into the season with them. And are they good enough to make the playoffs? No, absolutely not. Are they bad enough to be in the Celebrini and Iserman sweepstakes? Also, probably no. They are in the worst possible spot they could be right now. They would have to get rid of Hellebuck and or, you know, whoever else. Like, yes, they lost Pierre-Luc Dubois. Yes, they lost Blake Wheeler. Uh, they added Iofalo. They added Gabe Velarde and, and um, Rasmus Kapari. And you're right. They're they're kind of in this flux. It's it's almost like the, the sentiment and the energy around the team, though. It's been this way ever since Dustin Bufflin threw Evander Kane's clothes in the shower <laughs> all those years ago. I miss Big Buff, by the way. Hockey was better when he was playing. Oh, 100%. What a hilarious guy. But if ever a team needed a full reset, it's the Winnipeg Jets. I understand the position they're in, though, right? Like, they are, they don't have the biggest arena. They're not in a metropolis where there's money pouring in from businesses and a massive, massive population. Like, yes, Putting a hockey team in Canada is like printing money. It's not new money, though. It's already in the system because those people are going to spend money on hockey anyways. But ownership is nervous about this team's long-term stability. And I get that. But this team kind of needs a reset, right? Like when players don't want to be there, when you have guys who don't want to be there and, and the room just isn't meshing or whatever it is, I understand it's easy for someone on the outside to say, yeah, get rid of your stars, get picks. You don't want to get rid of your good players, but... Connor Hellebuck might be open to coming back to, to Winnipeg. Okay, what are you going to do with that? Like, you got to know or you got to make a move. You're right, Brad. The, the patient approach, the steady hand is often, like I would say, nine times out of ten the way to go in hockey because it's so reactionary and you don't want to make a move and you tear things apart for no reason. But I feel like the clock has already run out on the Winnipeg Jets. Mind you, I'm saying all this now. They're going to be a surprise Western Conference wildcard team. But still, like, they're not trending in the right way for me. They need to have a big year, kind of have like a, a New York Islanders type come together, be greater than the sum of their parts season in my mind to be at all a factor in this conversation. You know how Micah does his misery index every year? And it's like, uh, teams that are going to miss the playoffs but also not pick in the top 10 and they get rocketed to the top of the ministry index. Yeah. It just does just not look like there's going to be a giant Winnipeg background on that chart all year. It's going to be tough for them. They're not bad enough to bottom out, but they're 
their best case scenario is getting absolutely slapped around in the first round. Okay. Team that is interesting and has kind of had some weird narratives around them. The Arizona Coyotes. Uh, much like the Blackhawks, they're going to lose a lot of games, but Logan Cooley is going run to run around and do cool shit, and their fans aren't going to care. I don't know, man. I think I'm more optimistic on the Coyotes. I think I saw them do way better than I anticipated last season. I think 70 points was better than I had them projected for. Granted, that's not that was still good for, was it fourth last in the conference, second last in their, in their division, uh, Chicago only behind them. But I think Logan Cooley, you're right, is, is going to come in and do some cool shit. I think... Who else did they add? Yeah, it was Jason Zucker, Alex Kerfoot, Nick Bukestat, Matt Dumba, Sean Dursey, Stetcher is over there. Like, they, It's not an all-star lineup, but with the way they're coached and the way that team has played last season, I could see them making some noise. I, I'm not projecting them to be like first in the division or anything, but I could see them being maybe one of the teams on the outs for a wildcard spot. The one thing I will say definitively about Arizona, because they're such a weird team in such a weird spot that I can't really wrap any definitive conclusions in my head. They're better than Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. Thank goodness for Chicago making that conversation easy. The St. Louis Blues. Talk about a team without direction. That's an interesting team. They added Kevin Hayes. Yeah, let's get older. That seems like it's going to work. Weird. Old team, few prospects, almost none of like any significance outside of Dvorsky. Their blue line is a billion years old, and all of them are signed for a hundred years. Their goaltender's a sociopath, <laughs> and they have little depth up front. But they're not bad enough to be in the Celebrini Iserman sweepstakes. But they're not good enough for anybody to take him seriously. Anything more seriously than like a fringy playoff team. Like they're the Detroit Red Wings without the stacked prospect pool. And that's a horrible place to be right now. I think they go as Jordan Bennington goes. Are they going to get Jordan Bennington, the absolute psycho who stops pucks? Or are they going to get Jordan Bennington, the absolute psycho who lets in seven goals and then tries to fight the entire other team? If it's like the last couple of years, they're going to get both, which does not equal a playoffs. That team is... Well, you know what? Relevant to the Red Wings, Jacob Vrana has been over there for a limited sample size. And much like when Jacob Vrana first came to Detroit, looks really good. He's scoring. And I want to preface all this by saying I hope, as just like a a fan of Jacob Vrana in general, I hope everything works out for him personally and he's able to kind of stay healthy and in the lineup. Because I think as long as he does, he he is going to perform in such a way that a lot that's going to leave a lot of Red Wings fans angry. Because so far, he's scoring goals. So if he goes in there and makes a difference, that's actually a tick in their favor that they added late last season. When I was thinking about this division today and I got to the Blues, I, I, I do this thought experiment with every team. And what I came to with the Blues is Vrana, Thomas, Kairou, Shen, Buchnevich. I had to put a lot of thought in to even remember another forward on this team. Yeah, Their depth up front is horrible and their defense might be worse. But... Those five guys I mentioned aren't bad, and Bennington does have a tendency to run hot for stretches of time in whatever meaning of that word you want to use, but that does not equal a good team. The Nashville Predators. This is a team that I actually was ready to write off a couple seasons ago, and I've been surprised by how well they've held in terms of being competitive in the NHL still. Oh, I, I, I'm i ready to write them off. As Stanley Cup contenders? Oh, yeah, I'm not talking Their about Their window is dead. I wouldn't be shocked if they slipped into the playoffs this year, although... That's what I mean. My thought experiment with St. Louis could apply to Nashville as well because, holy hell, their bottom six forwards are tragic. Their defense is better, and they have UC Soros. That's the difference, right? That They're one is of the best the goalies on the planet. You know, you add Nyquist and O'Reilly, and it helps. Yep. Uh, they don't have depth up front. The defense is okay, but they've got an all-world goalie. So their range of outcomes is pretty wide, both good and bad. And as we've discovered talking about this division, it's probably the worst division in hockey. So, yeah, can't can't rule anybody out in this division beyond Chicago, in my yeah. opinion. And Nashville might be at the top of the less certain teams. In a 
in the Eastern Conference, Nashville would have a much harder time, I feel, on paper. In, in the Eastern Conference, Nashville's a non-factor. Yeah, but I think you're right. I think in the West, they could potentially make some wild card noise here. They're a good candidate to finish fourth in the Central. I don't think the Central's getting any wild card spots this year because I like the Pacific a lot more. But if you're fourth in a division, it means you likely have a realistic shot at a wild card spot. And that looks like that's Nashville's trajectory this year, even if I ultimately don't think they get in. Minnesota. Still good, but not good enough, which has been Minnesota for 18, 19 years. I see them as leading the next tier. So there's the Colorado Dallas tier in Minnesota. I don't see them like. They might grab that third divisional seed, barring someone else surprising. But I see them more as the next year rather than being one of the top three. They are the definitive grocery stick in this division in my mind. I think there's enough separation between them and the teams we've already talked about that I don't lump them in with them. But I also think there's enough separation between them and Dallas and Colorado that I don't lump them in with them. I think Minnesota is firmly third in this division, and I don't think it's going to be challenged from either direction. You, uh, injuries and everything change a million things, but barring something unforeseen, yeah, I think that three spot is theirs to lose. I think what really could change things for them this season is if Marco Rossi emerges as a player, which is a big question mark. The poor guy has had a terrible development path with you know, the heart condition he had over the course of the, uh, the pandemic, which put him out. And, you know, anytime you lose years of hockey, it's not good for the player. But at such a formative time in your development, like that is, that's tough. I'm rooting for Marco Rossi. He has all the talent in the world. So hope he can come through and really kind of stick as a player. But he's someone who I could see, you know, making a big difference and potentially having them surprise. Now the top two, which is not going to be a surprise to anyone. Uh, let's start with the Dallas Stars, who I think is a serious cup contender. I'm going to have the same comment for Dallas and Colorado. And anybody who's watched any of these, either of these teams play in the last two years, I don't think can refute it with any sort of logic. Stacked at every position, and the depth is phenomenal. Yeah. Unreal teams. Legitimate Stanley Cup contenders near the tippy top of that list. Yeah. Like Hints, Pavelski, Robertson as a likely top. Like that is uh, Wyatt Johnston, which that one hurts for Red Wings fans to see. It's that he's going to be what their second line center. Like that's. Haskinen as a Norris candidate on defense, yeah. Ottinger as a Vesna candidate in net, like just stacked. And Ottinger to me is the big difference. Like we talked about UC Saros, Ottinger is in that level of he can play, you know, top of the planet goaltending. And if you have an unreal stacked team where, you know, Sagan is probably on your third line and you're hoping he has a good year in a depth role, like if Ottinger comes in, then that propels them to the top of the West in my mind in terms of serious cup contenders. So, it's very funny that the two poles of the central division, it seems like most of the teams are on one side and then you have Colorado and Dallas on the other. Speaking of Colorado, Colorado. If they're healthy, they're a cup favorite in my mind. McKinnon, Rantanen, Taze, McCarr, like it's almost unfair. Even with Landis Gog out, mm -hmm. they still seem like one of the most star heavy rosters in the NHL. And that's how you win games in the NHL nowadays. They did, like, anytime you have a, a team in the position that they're in, just perpetually good, you are going to have to cycle through players who were important to you before or maybe were in death rolls or pulled up uh, because of injuries. And I'm, I'm talking about JT Confer. I'm talking about, you know, players elsewhere in the lineup, like Newhook or, or whoever else. Like Those guys cycle out. And you say, yeah, that's a big loss for them. They also added Ross Colton to the team, which was a big addition, like, uh, I think Miles Tomas Tatar. Yeah, I think Miles Wood was an interesting addition as well. Jonathan Drewen, you know, who's to say what they're going to be able to do with him? That's a guy with a lot of talent. That if they can put him in the right situation, which time and time again, how many times have we seen this story in hockey where a player some people might think is washed? You put him with ultra talented players who know him. McKinnon is one of Drewen's biggest fans, and all of a sudden they get on the cheap a really productive player. So. To me, Colorado is the top of the West and the top of this division in my mind. I don't know. With Landis out, I don't know if I like them more than Dallas, but it's neck and neck. I could be I could be talked into either side of that. Devon Taves, is, his contract situation is going to be interesting. It'll suck for them in the offseason with how much they're going to have to pay him or let him walk, but you got a top defenseman in the world playing in a contract here. 
great great motivation for this season. Yeah, because you, you don't move them, right? You're competing for cups. Oh, you God, don't. no. Yeah, you don't sell anybody. That's why the narrative around Nylander in Toronto is always stupid to me. It's like, okay, yeah, he might leave, but you're trying for the Stanley Cup this year. Like, you, got, you have to keep your best players. Exactly. Colorado's in the same boat. Yeah, would they get an absolute haul for Devontae's? 100%. But you know what's better than a haul for Devontae's? Another cup. Yeah, one Stanley Cup solves a lot of problems. Yeah. So, all right, your order for the Central Division, which way are you going? Colorado, Dallas at the top. Um, I'm actually going to put Dallas at one just because I think the war of attrition favors them a little bit more in the regular season. I don't necessarily think they'll go further in the playoffs, Mm -hmm. potentially, but I'll go Dallas, Colorado. Minnesota, three, as I mentioned. I think you're going to have that mushy middle of Nashville, St. Louis, uh, and Winnipeg battling. For the wild card spots, I'll go St. Louis, Nashville, Winnipeg in that order. Mm -hmm. Then I'll go Arizona, Chicago. Okay. I have Colorado, Dallas. I'm going to stick to the status quo here. I'm going to also leave Minnesota, you know, perpetually in that grocery stick spot. I'm going to say Arizona because I think Logan Cooley is cool and I'm buying into the hype right now. Then I'll go St. Louis, Winnipeg, and then Chicago. Did you have Nashville in there? Nashville right behind Minnesota, so okay. fourth, yeah. So it's not the most fascinating division in the middle. I don't want to say that they're going to have no wild card spots, but it would be a surprise if they did grab one in my mind. But we'll see. In any case, that's our central division, brief central division preview. If anything changes with these teams, obviously we'll cover it. But for now, we're going to wrap that up. And we are actually going to jump into our interview with Lauren Gable professional women's hockey player recently drafted by boston good friend of yours brad so this is her second time on the show but instead of being a remote because i think the first time was during the pandemic it was she was in studio today which was awesome so our conversation with pwhl player lauren gable enjoy this interview milestone for the podcast today we still don't have evan here but it's a full table and for the first time we have a professional hockey player in here no thanks to you brad (laughs) <laughs> we are joined by Lauren Gable, recent draft pick of the Boston to be determined in the <laughs> PWHL. Lauren, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> you are what a ride it's been for you because you have been on every side of the women's professional hockey saga, and you were recently drafted twenty second overall by Boston. Yes, in yeah. the newly formed PWHL. So, before we jump into the questions, how are you feeling? Um, it's been a a lot of ups and downs. Um, you know, obviously hearing that the PHF was uh folding, um, and then obviously PWHPA was kind of folding too in order to create this one league. But um, you know, everything's looking up, and it's going to be a really positive transition for women's hockey. So I guess we'll get the negative out of the way first, <laughs> just because obviously so much stuff has happened behind the scenes that you know there's no clear stories. When the PHF folded. How did that, like, unveil itself for you? How did you find out and what happened in the immediate aftermath? We were on a Zoom call with everyone, but the media somehow found out before us. So technically we found out through Twitter (laughs) (laughs) that our league was folding. And then um, they told us in the Zoom call, but, like, everyone was already, like, messaging each other, like, what's happening? Like, what the heck? Like, why is this happening? All this stuff. And then on the Zoom call, they had told us that they were creating the PWHL. So here we are. And yeah. Does this feel to you like the final stop that professional women's hockey has been waiting for? Never mind how crazy and often messy the journey has been, and it has been to, to sell it short. But does this feel like what professional women's hockey has been holding out for forever? I mean, I hope so. <laughs> I don't know how many other leagues I can play in, but <laughs> or teams I can play for. But um, I think just having one league with like best of the best um, in North America, I think it's uh, it's a good 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 start, and I think it's only going to go up from here. So, what was the chatter like the day after? Like, obviously between you, your teammates, the rest of the girls in the league, because. The dynamic's so different. Obviously, you came off leading the league in scoring. You won the league MVP. You're sitting there probably pretty sure you're getting a spot in the new (laughs) league. But that obviously isn't the case for a a good amount of the PHF. So what was that like in the following days? Yeah, people were obviously upset. And I think it took a a few people to just kind of realize, like, 
let it sink in and like realize what's happening. But um, I do feel bad for some of the players in the PW and the PHF because like normally you want to end on your own terms, not um, being able to make a team or anything like that um, or being chosen. You want to like just be able to retire like an NHL player does. Um, so it was definitely hard for some of them. And I, I know that they – once they heard the news, they were like, oh, I'm not going to make it, so I might as well just hang up the skates now. And they didn't even bother like signing up for the draft or anything like that, which was obviously upsetting because I think a lot of them still had pot- potential. Um, but, yeah, no, it was just all around, just all the diff- all different mo- emotions and stuff like that. So um, it was pretty crazy in that, in that moment. So then in the transition, obviously, PHF folds. Everybody knows what's going on there. The, the new league is announced. But at first, the details were basically nothing. It's like, hey, you're going to a new league. Oh, cool. What's it going to be? I don't know. Where? No clue. <laughs> How was all that information, like, uh, as it came out, given to you guys behind the scenes or, you know, as PHF players? Or was it just kind of you found out with through the media? It was kind of um, – we were kind of left in the dark, not going to lie. Um, both parties, I think. Um we weren't really sure what was happening. We didn't know when we were starting, when anything was going to actually form. Uh, we didn't know when the draft was going to be, what the teams were going to be until like literally recently, like maybe a month ago, we found out where the locations were going to be for the teams. But um, I think like what happened was we found out through our Zoom calls that we had with them, but majority of the information we found out was through Twitter and social media. So It was kind of, like, hard for us to, like, you know, not be a part of it and hear it first. Um, But eventually they did tell us on Zoom calls and stuff, which was nice of them. But, um, yeah, it was basically through social media. (laughs) So, you know, I'm not going to ask you to dissect or air out any dirty laundry here. Obviously, it's been pretty (laughs) dramatic, the the feud between the PHF and the PWHPA. You having been on both sides of it, how did those two sides interact once— this new PWHL was formed. So after the dissolution of the PHF, was there any sense of, you know, the war is over, now we're all on the same side? Or how has that kind of simmered at all? Um, I think it it kind of sort of, like, everyone just came together. Um, yeah. Um, but the one thing that, like, the PHF players were, like, kind of bothered about was that we weren't a part of the CBA. Mm -hmm. Um, So we didn't have, like, a say in that at all. Um, So it was just kind of hard, a hard pill to swallow because, like, they're taking our players and we're forming a league with them, but we don't have a say in um, the CBA, which also affects us and the players that are going to play in the new league. Um, So that was just kind of hard for us, but, um, you know, it's it's good now and (laughs) it's all positive. Yeah, so moving to the positives, now as the draft day is leading up and everything with the PHF is done, over, established, you kind of got a feeling for what's going on in the new league. What was the process like for you behind the scenes leading up to it? Because obviously there was the free agency period, the draft period. Um, I'm sure your agent (laughs) was working a million miles an hour behind the scenes. How much conversation was had, you know, leading up to free agency and then the draft? Yeah, so I didn't talk to any of the GMs or coaches or anything. Um, actually, they didn't have coaches yet. So um, it's just the GMs that my agent was talking to um, prior to the free agency and then obviously to the draft. But the one GM I did talk to was Boston. Um, she wanted to talk to me before the draft happened. Um, obviously, I told her that I wanted to go to Boston. Um, but anywhere I was drafted to, I would have been happy to be at um, just to play the sport I love. Um, but yeah, it was just all crazy because like, at the draft was literally like insane because you didn't know when you were going to be picked or anything like that. It was actually kind of funny because the teleprompter would like go up and you could see your name before you were called. So like (laughs) (laughs) I wasn't just like, you know, uh, drafted Lauren Gable. I could actually see it before they actually said it. So, (laughs) you know, I just had a little second to like take it in. (laughs) The teleprompter guy played a big part in professional women's hockey history. (laughs) (laughs) He sure did. But, um, yeah, no, it was all crazy. Definitely a lot of uh, um, conversations with my uh, uh, agent and the GMs, but I had no part in that. So you go away in mid-November for training camp in Boston? Yes, correct. What does preparation look like for you now? The business side is over, so to speak. I know there's still a contract to be worked out and everything, but 
you are now gearing up for an inaugural season in a what's supposed to be a, a landmark professional women's hockey league. What are you doing to prepare now as a pro hockey player? Just working out every day, yeah. um, skating a couple times a week, um, just having fun playing golf, taking it day by day and seeing where it goes. Yeah, because the working out part doesn't surprise me because this is the psychopath who, when she was playing beer league <laughs> with us, we'd come in, oh, how, how, how many uh, K on the bike this morning? 30. Okay, and then she's skating circles around everybody out there. Meanwhile, all us fatties are dying by the end of the first period yeah. while she's still got more energy than the rest of us. Yeah, it just goes to show what pearl athletes like. It's it's not the same sport. <laughs> like Lauren does not play the same sport. As no, us. not by absolutely any means, not. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, it made beer league very easy though because on the breakout I would get the pass and then I would look up for the blonde ponytail to just be flying somewhere <laughs> in the neutral zone, and I'd, I'd take my assist and get the hell off the ice. It was real easy. So you're coming into a league that has you know its own original six. Is there any sense of I want to say like trepidation or anxiousness because the goal is for this league to set its roots, grow and grow quickly. I have to imagine. So ideally within the next, you know, X number of years, we're going to see even more teams added here, hopefully as the PWHL sees immediate success. Does that factor into any of your thinking coming in or at this point, are you just happy to be playing? I'm just happy to be playing right now. Um, obviously in the future, there's going to be hopefully more teams. Um, but I just hope it's it's financially stable for everyone. Um, you know, like the base salary is going to be 35K. Um, I mean, that's not very livable, but they also are offering a stipend for housing. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, in the future, obviously, with like sponsorships and everything like that, like the league's going to grow and um, hopefully we, we get more teams and, and more financial um, stability. The yep. NHL for a long time has said that they are not going to <laughs> wade into the waters of professional women's <laughs> hockey until that there's one league. Yeah. Now that there's one league, they have put out kind of tacit support. Is there any kind of sense that that, you know, more tangible support uh, is coming in the behind the scenes? Has has that been felt by the players or? I think I don't know if it's more like money side of things. I think it's like obviously there's money a part of it, but I think it's more like um supporting us and like helping us like create a, a women's hockey league that they can also be a part of like to help us move forward and mm -hmm. make sure that in the future it stays afloat yeah a thousand percent I, did you, I was thinking about it when you were talking there before you might have a, a unique distinction in the history of pro sports you might be the only player ever drafted employed by the title sponsor <laughs> <laughs> is so true do you know how much we were laughing when you're uh, when your uh, little stat card came up after you were drafted and Hockey Life was right in the corner as a sponsor. It's <laughs> so it's funny. Oh, it was great. They tagged me on tw on Instagram, too. They were like, of one of our very own <laughs> drafted. And That's I was, amazing. I was dying. <laughs> oh, it was phenomenal. We we were having a good laugh at, at the story of it, too, because we were getting mad, too, because we're like, how is she still on the board? And everybody's like, well, she did kind of say publicly she wanted to go to Boston. So let's just <laughs> let's pay close attention when they come up. And sure enough. Um, but getting back to the actual upcoming season, in terms of um, your GM and your coach, what have they kind of braced you for in terms of what, for lack of a better term, life is going to be like once the season is underway? If I'm being completely honest with you, I don't know much right now. Um, all I know is training camp starts in November. I'm assuming we're going to be there for like four, four weeks ish and then head back home for Christmas break. I'm assuming. And then games and practices will start in January. But other than that, I don't have a schedule yet. So I have no idea. No one, no one knows anything right now. Goes to show like the razor's edge of all of this. Eh? Like it's coming yeah. up and not to say it's, it's disorganized or anything, but it's a massive operation to put together mm -hmm. and it all happened in a flash. So, yeah. you know, a top a first round draft or like, you know, someone drafted to one of the original six teams and you're still just know, not flying by the seat of your pants, but you're still figuring it out as you go. It, it's really hard to, to do what these women are doing and, and trying to establish. Oh yeah. It's crazy. We're, a, you're a month and a half out from training camp. You don't even know your team name yet. Yeah. You don't have a schedule. So whoever is doing the work behind their scenes, they are going to be the heroes of this league by the time well, it gets started. It's even like the, uh, players who are were invited to like the training camps and stuff like a boston player was invited to an ottawa training camp or something like that but like how do you know like they can find living or housing when like 
they're not sure if they're even going to make the team. Do you know what I mean? So like, yeah. there's a lot of like different things to look at with with all of this too. But I mean, it would have been really cool to, um, when you were drafted to show what jersey you were, you know, like <laughs> yeah. that would have been a really cool way to like present what um each team was gonna like their jersey was gonna look like. It yeah. been really neat, but. Yeah, I'm waiting for these like neon green and yellow jerseys that you guys are going to be getting. I hope like traditional green is good. But if we go like full on the Seattle Seahawks level of holy hell, yeah, that would be phenomenal. So you're going to have league play starting in 2024. Now, women's hockey, for good reason, has been centered around international play for the longest time, because that's essentially, you know, the highest form of competition that you could find. How has this affected the whole international scope of things that's obviously its own political game you know hockey canada is no stranger to that but (laughs) has that changed the kind of uh, landscape for international hockey who makes it what's a priority in terms of tournaments or anything um i actually believe that there we're gonna have a break for the world championships so april march april whatever whenever they are um there will be like uh three week two week break or something in there so Mm -hmm. that um players picked can go play at the world championships um and then i'm assuming that there's going to be series against the u.s or whatever but um i'm assuming that's going to be before january not during the season so that we don't have to pull players because like there's obviously going to be a lot of players missing um clearly but um yeah no i that's what i've heard yeah, actually, on that note, too, because I, I was actually pleasantly surprised during the draft to see the American teams pick a lot of Canadian players yeah. and vice versa, which I was curious to see if it was going to be a little separated that way. But uh, obviously, now that you have most of Boston's roster, are there a player or two that you're excited to play with that you've maybe never played with before? I think uh, Niter and Keller, <laughs> um, obviously, they're, they've had amazing careers thus far. And um Knight has been one of those players who's been on top of everything like throughout her whole career. So it'd be nice to play with her and uh, be on a team with her. And then Keller, obviously a well-established defenseman um, on the D D side. And um, obviously they're American. So like kind of against, but like it's a positive for us because they're on our team, but uh, I'm excited to to play with them and and everyone else on our team too. Have you been online reading any of the previews or reviews of the draft? All that. (laughs) Cool. Let me fill you in on something that's gonna that I was reading that was hilarious. <laughs> so it was kind of like not one of like a winners and losers of the draft, but like kind of what to expect from each team. And um, I think the one quote I saw was uh, Boston's power play should be lethal because you can deploy Hillary Knight on one <laughs> wing and Lauren Gable on the other <laughs> side, and goalies will just cry. <laughs> <laughs> so has, has that possibility crossed your mind yet? I mean, yeah that would, that would be pretty lethal um you know adding like keller to the the top there to lead the power play and then i don't know like mueller or rattray or someone like that um even sophie jacks i'm probably butchered that last name pronunciation but um you know we have like a pretty big depth chart and i'm excited to get going and see what happens this year i'm going to take a repeat question from i think the last time you were on uh, but you know, women's hockey is, has not struggled to find a footing in terms of the level of competition or anything, but in terms of getting it in front of people's eyes, what do you think is the most important thing for this newly formed league to do to make sure that people see women's hockey and appreciate the insane levels of talent going into the PWHL? I think having like a good, um, television, um, like Sportsnet or TSN, like making sure all of the games are like televised. Like, I mean, you look at football, like people will like tune in all the time to watch that. And like, it would also be nice if, um, say like the Bruins played at seven or something and we played before that, like people can like tune into that and like the Boston Bruins can like promote us and like, or vice versa. If they play at like 2 PM, which I know they play like some games at like earlier in the afternoon, we play later, like the broadcasters can be like, oh yeah, tune into this, uh, PWHL game. Like, I feel like a lot of like, um, promotional things have to go into this in order for this league to be successful and people to want to watch women's hockey. You guys ended up drafting a ton of Clarkson alum too, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. So that must be nice for you guys. Just recreate those uh, championship teams. Exactly. Winning formula for Boston. And we're going to be green. So Clarkson was green. (laughs) You know, it's it's looking up here. (laughs) 
There's a, there's a winning formula, and it's all in the aesthetics <laughs> and the vibes. That's pretty much all hockey's about. <laughs> Any yeah. message you wanted to get out there? No. Just watch the PWHL this year. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. Lauren Gable, Boston to be named, PWHL. <laughs> Lauren, thank you for being the first pro hockey player in this room. Uh, good luck in your upcoming preparations for the season. We'll chat with you uh, again in the future, but uh, go crush it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And that was our interview with Lauren Gable. Always good to have a friend on the show and very cool, honestly, to have a pro hockey player. So it's going to be a little bit surreal to hopefully turn on the TV and be able to see her play for Boston. Shame on her for making us at all root for a, a Boston professional sports team. But until Detroit gets one, that's yeah. going to have to be my rooting interest in the meantime. Yeah. So uh, best of luck to her. Best of luck to the PWHL as they obviously are still continue to get things set up. You know, you heard us talk to her about it. This is all happening very fast on the fly. It's an on the fly line change right now. Oh, 100%. So for these women, I hope the league holds its ground holds its own and i hope the nhl provides the support that's needed to not just you know in terms of funding but logistics and things because it'd be very cool to have this be very cool to have the pro women's hockey conversation to no longer be about the politics or what league people are playing or whatever rather than did you see lauren's hat trick last night or you know whoever won that year like we just want to watch hockey oh 100 percent. all hockey is good hockey and that's going to be some of the best okay Let's jump into overtime. Overtime on this midweek episode of the Winged Wheel podcast is Patreon exclusive. Our patrons are what make everything that we do possible. Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel podcast if you want to support the show. You get benefits like the Discord, the giveaways, the bonus episodes like I mentioned at the top of the show. You allow us to do things like host Winged Wheel podcast nights at the LCA in partnership with the Red Wings. That's completely funded by us and so we really can't do it without our patrons. You allow us to uh, support the Jamie Daniels Foundation in our various fundraising initiatives. In addition to that, we have expanded the Winged Wheel podcast kind of content universe, uh, Expected by Whom is a show hosted by Prashant Iyer and Sean Shapiro, and that has only been made possible by our Patreon support to support. So again, patreon.com slash Winged Wheel podcast if you want to go above and beyond and support the show. Captain Antonio Gracias of the United Federation of Cheesebags says, do you guys think COSA might get a look during preseason? Or is it too early based off of what we saw in the prospect tourney? He'll what get do you a mean? Look. Yeah, he'll get a look. I don't think he's going to be in any serious contention for the roster, but he's going to get probably several looks yeah. because, I mean, he's in his 20s now where the, the training wheels are off. Yeah. Remember, this is also for guys who go to the AHL, this is still their training camp. Yeah. So even if Kosa is not making the NHL roster, like Bednar played well last night. He'll have a tough time making the roster because there's Lyon and Reimer ahead of him. But he, he's going to get his look and he's going to get his reps and the team isn't going to expect him to you know, stop every puck. But yeah, it, this is what preseason is for, trying out the guys who otherwise wouldn't get NHL ice. Apple Cider says, if you could have Bergeron or Datsu go back in age and join the Red Wings as a rookie this year, who would you want and why? Patrice Bergeron is one of the most respected hockey players of all time. The answer here is Datsuk and there's no question about it. Yeah, that's not, I'm not even hesitating in my mind. Yeah. Patrick J says, I've been having a sinking feeling that we start with an 11 forward seven defenseman look. Assuming Edmondson has a realistic shot to be one of those seven, who do you think is the odd man out as a healthy scratch to start the year? Mo, Wallman, Sherratt, Mata, Ghost, Hall, Petrie, or Edmondson? Man, there's no way to know. I know it's such a cop out answer, but I could see. Like, if it's for me, it's probably Sherratt, but I could see that being Mata. I could see that being Petrie. I could see that being basically everybody but the guys who just signed contracts, honestly. Yeah, if this was a – if they do go 11-7, I, I would imagine Edvinson would have a harder time breaking in. Yeah, e either way. Like, he's he's got seven NHL defensemen ahead of him, one of whom's going to be a healthy scratch that probably has no business actually being a healthy scratch in the NHL. What, by the way, what a terrific problem to have. But until there aren't seven good NHL defensemen blocking his path, it is what it is. Kevin Wolf says it, it's only been one preseason game, but Rasmussen not only looked good out there, but seems to be in line to play a very important, possibly second line role. That, along with how important and impactful he was last season prior to injury, what would you project his next contract to look like? Who might be some comparables? Oh, my God. I don't even, He is the biggest mystery on that one for me. I don't even have a good guess because I feel like 
the organization loves him, the coach loves him, the team loves him, but I don't think his actual value is where his perceived value is, and that could create a really interesting dynamic in contract negotiations. Steve Eisman is notorious for guys internal grinding them. So I have no concern about, oh, this guy's perceived value is going to get him overpaid if they come from within the organization. Outside UFAs, I, I think the Red Wings have overpaid, and that's just the nature of trying to convince guys to come to Detroit. But yeah, I I would imagine that that might be a little bit of a grind. That said, you don't know how Rasmussen's coming into this, what his mindset is. His contract is going to expire after this season. He's an RFA with Arbrights, right? So arbitration is a funny thing in the NHL. They almost always look at just simple point totals. It has been a little bit more complicated and nuanced over the years, but they come right down the middle. I don't know. I, you're right. That's a big mystery. He's he's a player in transition right now and where he ultimately lands. Like I don't think he's going to get a mega contract in terms of AAV. I could see them potentially going for a what Tampa Bay has done with low dollar long-term value or long-term uh, uh, year contract. That would make sense. Yeah, I wouldn't hate that. It's a little bit of a risk, and I don't know that I love doing that for any player, but Rasmussen, you're right, like has such a big impact in this organization. It's such a wild change from when he first came in. Josh Terrell says, want to get your guys' thoughts on scouting players defensively. Watching games of JT Confer last year, I was sort of expecting to see a different player due to his strong defensive metrics. He seems to actually have a low work rate in the zone, and I only occasionally saw him make plays that prevented quality chances or caused turnovers. At the same time, he rarely appeared to be vastly out of position or directly responsible for goals. How do you guys personally determine whether a player is just efficient defensively as opposed to lazy or disinterested? There's no fully accurate answer here. For me, the two things I focus on are positioning and timing. When are you making the aggressive play? When are you just covering a spot? When are you just covering a zone? When are you just covering a man? When are you activating into a scrum, into ch a chase? Again, it, it's such an imperfect understanding of what truly makes good defensive players good. But those are the two things that jump out to me generally. Yeah, you can't discount the fact that if you have the puck in the offensive zone and you're keeping the puck, like you're, are you doing anything explicitly defensively? No, but the other team isn't getting shots on net. They're not getting quality chances if you're keeping the puck. So that's going to look different than a guy who's making you know, amazing defensive stops or blocking shots or whatever. Good defense is often really kind of like unsexy. Uh, being in the right position, not having to like skate your ass off to break up a, a breakaway or a two on O or something. That's probably better than doing those things because you were in the right position at the right time. Nicholas Lidstrom was called the perfect human because he was just never out of position. He never really had to make a big hit because his stick did all the work for him and he was always in the right spot. Was he the world's best skater? No. Was he the world's strongest player? No. Was he... The world's hardest shooter. No, but his heart shot was actually really underrated. When you look back at the defensive shots of the past, his is underrated. But he was just so always in the exact right place. So uh, you just got a, a um, lecture on Nick Lidstrom that you didn't ask for. But yeah, defense is a, is a complicated thing to scout, even for the pros, for, for all those reasons. Which is why the meatheads like Brad just talk about offense all the time. They just don't appreciate us defensemen. We don't put goals on the board, so we don't get paid as much. I certainly didn't. I had a terrible shot. Okay, uh, Brad, you have a tight timeline here, so we're going to wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in. This was a midweek show. We're back, except for Evan. He's off <laughs> doing goodness knows what in Italy. Hopefully he comes back to us one day. But uh, in the meantime, thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you, Lauren Gable, for joining us in studio for the interview. And thank you to all of our listeners, new and old, for listening to the Winged Wheel Podcast. We can't tell you how excited we are for another year for Red Wings Hockey. More announcements coming up, but in the meantime, Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA. Get your tickets fast because they do go, and we want to make sure everyone who wants one of those beanies a chance to meet Ken Daniels and more gets their opportunity. To all of our Patreon supporters, we could not do it without you. To our name level supporters on Patreon, thank you so very much. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Akefer, Samuel Soderholm, Raymond's Missing Tooth, Icon, Brad's Lord and Savior, Bradley Cleveland. Glenn Brabham, Everybody Loves Raymond, 
Croner's Left Knee, Sea Lion, Keenan O'Donoghue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Admiral Matt S. of the Cheesebag Navy, Brad owes me a beanie, Brian J. Bauer, Buck the Suckeyes, Carl Brutana Nanaluski, Carzone 13, Citizen High Five, Clip Clop, Nay Nay, Congratulations, Ryan, Mel, and Abby. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Connor Scovey, Cooking with Kosa, Coyote Season Tickets in Anywhere But Tempe, Craig Kibble, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Exquisitine Buble Schwinslow, Give Blood Fight Probert, Hockey Town Love, Hockey Town Matt, Hassam Al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Kalen Wood, King Tone, Marcus, Marlon Winchester, Matt K, Cannon Fodder, The Cheesebag Army, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, R.A., Red 3, Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Scree and Lube, That's What I Appreciate it's About You, Wallman's Elite Dancing D, Iser Plan Stan, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, Adam Rose, Axel's Sandy Pelica, Big Cheese, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, Captain Antonio Gracias of the United Federation of Cheesebags, Chuck Buffchest, the Tarpless Goon, Clappin' Bombs and Respectin' Moms, Commander Ben Barron of the Cheesebag Space Force, Connor, Connor Leighton, Corey Prita, Darren Fick, D Boss, Snip Show, Frank Stanley, Gene Sullivan, Griffey Boy, Henrik Robert Deeks, James Laporte, James Pridemore, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans Derogatory, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Linda Hull, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Nora Sider, O. Ophelia, Stephen, The Hodag, The Hat123, Winging It in San Diego, Wings Fan in Alaska, X, formerly A.A. Ron, and your second favorite patron. Thank you so very much. We'll talk to you Sunday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.